Good evening. This is John Coates here in Natick, Massachusetts. This tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. This is November 20th, 2000, and this evening we are pleased to have with us Robert Sinclair. Robert, how are you? Very good, thank you. Do people just call you Bob? Bob, for the most part. Bob, yes, okay. May I ask first how old you are? I'm 52 years old. 52, and your current address? Westwood, Massachusetts, 02090. Okay, and your current marital status? Married. Married. Do you have children, Bob? Two children, a son, uh, 25, and a daughter, 21. Uh, let's stretch it a little. Do you have any grandchildren? Not yet. Not no, yet. No, okay. No, You're working waiting. on that. Where were you born, Bob? I was born in Framingham, Massachusetts. Framingham, the town right next to us here. Correct. And were you raised there? No. I grew up my entire life in Natick, Massachusetts. I, only, I was born in Framingham. I lived there two or three months, and then I lived the rest of my formative years, uh, as well as my high school years in Natick, Mass. Okay. And can you tell us about your family? We have a very large family. Uh, I had this ten children in my family. I'm the oldest of seven boys. The oldest was my sister, then seven consecutive boys, then two girls. Um, so we had a very large family growing up. Uh, and very close-knit family, actually. Um, we still have my best friends in the world right now are still my brothers. Um, we get together on the holidays. Very, very close-knit family. I know it has been. And how about your mom and dad? My dad passed away in uh, 1996. And my mom's still alive. She uh, just celebrated her 75th birthday. Mm -hmm. And we're all getting together this coming Thanksgiving at the house. And what about your, your upbringing? What did your dad do in, and your mom in this community? My mother was uh, a house mother, housewife. Um, she was involved in a lot of the activities that we were, Cub Scouts, Boy Scouts. My dad was uh, an electrotypist growing up, uh, very involved in youth sports, um, coached hockey, coached baby with baseball. Um, we were in a bowling league together. Um, he was very active uh, in the church, as was my mother, and she still is. Um, they were just superb, absolute superb parents. Couldn't ask for better. They were terrific. And a close-knit family that grew up in a small town? Very close-knit family. Uh, I loved Natick. Still do. I thought it was a marvelous community to grow up in. Um, what are your memories of growing up in Natick? Just a treasure, an absolute treasure. I have. Uh, just, I, I can't re recall any bad things, if you will, growing up or any bad memories. Uh, I loved the, the uh, town. I loved the, the community. Uh, I still have tr a tremendous amount of friends that grew up in Natick. Um, I played Little League sports, um, high school sports. Just a terrific, terrific upbringing. I, th I thought it was a terrific community to grow up in. So I really enjoyed it. Can you tell us what changes you've seen over the years from a uh, quiet town where you grew up uh, not quite contiguous with uh, Doug Flutie, but that no. he was part of your Doug uh, Flutie was a little, life here. Yeah, a little after me. Yeah, actually, my, my sister went to high school with him. My youngest sister, Lynette, went to high school with Doug Flutie. Um, I've seen, I guess, Natick expand and certainly, I think, population a little bit. Though, though I don't, I'm not sure population. Um, it was about 30,000 people, I think, when it was growing up. Um, I think I, I had the high school uh, was much larger at the time. I, I graduated with 500 plus people in my high school graduation class. Um, so I think the I think the school's systems are starting to get a little larger. But um, I I had nothing, and I still do have nothing but fond memories of growing up in Natick. Uh, just a marvelous community. That's very nice to hear. Uh, I, I really, really enjoyed it. If I've done my math right, you were born in 48? 48, 1948. 1948. May, 20, May 21st, 1948. 48, and then you went into high school, 50-something? Yeah, I went to high school, well, junior high. I went to Coolidge Junior High, which is now an elderly housing uh, complex um, on South Main Street. I entered Natick High School um, in 63, 1963, went there from 1963, and I graduated in uh, June of 1966. What was America like in 1966? What was going on? Yeah, if, it's almost like if you look, well, in 1966, what was going on, and I think the, um, 
the Vietnam War was just really starting to uh, really heat up quite a bit in intensity up until 64, 65. It, um, it, um, was still kind of low in intensity, but uh, the draft certainly was something that uh, all kids going to high school at the time were cognizant of. Uh, if you weren't going on to college, it was pretty understood that um, you had an excellent chance of being drafted into either the, the Army or the Marine Corps. Can you think back to, uh, as you moved along through high school, can you tell us what it was like for the guys to have this shadow, as it were, hanging over you. You know there was a war. You knew you were liable to be involved in it. Can mm -hmm. you tell us what that was like? I think it was more than, more than liable. I think it was pretty much understood that if you didn't specifically go on to college, you absolutely would get drafted. If you passed the draft and, and were selected for the draft, you probably more than likely going to end up going to Vietnam. So certainly there was a cloud hanging over the um, what was going to happen, at least to the male population. And the nation, certainly, at least in my class, was extremely patriotic. I think for the most part, uh, most of them felt that um, participating in, in the war and going to Vietnam was the right thing to do. Uh, certainly in 64, 65, and up until 66, I think that was uh, the predominant feeling. So, so the, w when you were in high school, you, your thought was not going on to college. Is that correct? Well, I think it was more of a, an economic reality uh, of a family situation that yeah. um, there was an affordability issue more than anything, I think, at the time. Um, so, no, I wasn't specifically going on to college right away. Um, so, I felt and I, I thought I would, and I'm going the service. Uh, getting drafted or volunteering for the service. Did you and talk this over with your folks? Oh, yeah. And I, I, again, I think growing up in the late 50s, early 60s, um, looking at the World War II generation, our fathers and our uncles, um, they all had served. And they all had served in World War II, and, and it was a very noble and, and uh, occupation, a very noble thing to have served, I think, in the country. And, and, uh, and that's how I felt. I was extremely, extremely patriotic. Um, so I had no qualms whatsoever about going in to serve, none. When you were a senior in high school, uh, did you and your fellow male seniors discuss what you were going to do? Oh, sure. Um, as a matter of fact, yeah. again, Vietnam was just starting at the time to build up, and we certainly talked about it. You know, I think the stock realization, at least for me personally, that came home about Vietnam was uh, one of the uh, pretty good friends of mine in high school, a kid named Keith Fomier, uh, got an early uh, graduation from high school in January of 1966 because he had enough credits to graduate. By the time I graduated, he'd already gone to the Marine Corps, gone to Vietnam, and got killed a week before I graduated from high school. So. Myself and a number of my friends uh, that were pretty close to Keith, it was a real stark, a real eye opener that you know Vietnam is is it's pretty real. It's pretty real. It's not just some John Wayne movie. You know, Did you so discuss among yourselves what branch of the service you would go into? Yeah, I, I hung around with a, a group as many males and seniors in high schools do. I, gr I hung around with a group of six to ten, twelve people, you know, they're pretty close buddies. Um, and oh yeah, we all discussed it. You know, some guys said, I'm not getting drafted, there's no way, I'm not going to the Marine Corps or the Army, though those guys are going to be fighting, I'm going to go in the, the Air Force or the Navy, uh, sign up for four years and go in the Air Force. Uh, f f they wouldn't have to worry about going in the infantry, if you will. So sure, we talked about it, but I think for the most part, uh, my peers were of the same feeling of me. We're pretty patriotic. Um, all of our fathers that I can think of served in the military. All my friends' fathers served in the mm -hmm. military. So we all had that, that feeling of, you know, July 4th parades, Memorial Day parades. Um, Natick was a pretty patriotic community. So serving in the military was, you know, a passage into manhood, if you will. In so. June of 66, specifically, what were your options? Uh, could you go down to a recruiting office 
and join any branch you wanted or uh, where you drafted and then told where you were going to go? Well, uh, no, what, you how could, did that work? The options were you could absolutely go down to any of the branches of service into the recruiting office, take the uh, general aptitude test as well as the physical examination to go into the service. And based upon your aptitude test, you could select whatever specific job in that military branch that would, would, be, would interest you. Mm -hmm. If you didn't do that, you basically just waited for your draft notice, reported for your draft physical. If you passed that, then you were drafted into the service, normally the Army. Some people are drafted in the Marine Corps. And took your chances of what assignment they're going to give you. And what happened to you specifically? I waited a while. I received my notice to report for the draft. I reported for the examination. I passed. And so I, I volunteered for the, the uh, I volunteered to go in the Army. Tell us about that now. Uh, how soon after graduation was it? About a year and a half after graduation. Okay, so we're up to 67 now? 68. 68? Yeah. Um, I received my draft report for my draft and I think um, April of 1968. I took my examination um, in May of 68. I passed it. I received the notice that you've passed your examination. So I just wanted to um, enjoy one more summer, if you will, in Natick. So I stayed the summer. Then I volunteered for the draft in September of 1968. I went to the Army recruiter in Framingham. And, uh, went into Boston, took my exam, and went into the Army. What about the six, eight, or ten guys that you hung around with in high school? Uh, were you alone now? I, I went personally alone, but um, one, two, three, four of them went into the Army, uh, two more in the, went into the Marine Corps, and three of them went on to college. Why did you pick the Army? Uh, I don't know. I, uh, my dad had served uh, quite a a stretch in the in the army. Um, I had two uncles that had served in the army, so it was just I, I I'm guessing uh, I'm trying to remember back. I, it was just that family tie, I yeah. guess, into the, the army yeah. as opposed to any other branches. Um, and I guess that's the one I had the most familiarity with. All right, tell us when the uh, the mailman finally brought that piece of paper and you left Natick. I left Natick and. Uh, September 1968, my dad drove me to uh, the South Boston Army Base on Summer Street in Boston. Uh, I went through the, the series of uh, the, exam the, day, the examination for the day, the aptitude test. I got sworn into the military, and I left that day for uh, Fort Gordon, Georgia. Fort Gordon? Yeah, Fort Gordon, Georgia, where I had my basic training. I uh, had basic training there for about eight weeks. I graduated from basic training, uh, and I went to uh, infantry training at Fort Jackson, South Carolina. Tell us about the, f the first place first. Fort Gordon, Georgia yeah, what was... what was uh, that like? You were how old now? Um, 18. 18 years old, and you're sent down to Georgia. I take it you'd never been there before? No, no. no I what never. was it like to land there? Um, red clay, red clay is what I can best describe it as. It was hard pan land. Um, Fort Gordon was a, a massive complex, a large, large uh, training facility. Um, it was hot, extremely hot. Um, what's, what's it near? What, what part of Columbus? Ge Georgia's, yeah. C Columbus, Georgia. Yeah. Oh, sure. Yeah. Oh, sure. Um, and of course, you didn't have much time to go downtown or anything. As a matter of fact, the first six weeks, you weren't even allowed off post. So. Um, you know, you had basic training, um, get up at 4 o'clock in the morning, have breakfast, uh, do your physical training, and then whatever types of training they're going to do that day, be it first aid or obstacle courses or the rifle range or whatever. Um, but the, for the first, week's le first six weeks, you never left the post. And what, one did, of the what did you like about this place? Not a whole bunch, actually. I think one of the problems for me personally is that I, I came from such a close-knit close -knit family that I was really extremely, extremely homesick. I really was. Uh, I missed my brothers, missed my parents. Um,
but as the longer you were there, obviously, the, the less homesick you became. But I, I really was the first two to three weeks, I was really extremely homesick. Um, there was, uh, by coincidence, a guy from Natick that also went in the service the same time I did, a guy named Dexter Cummings, who I had known casually in Natick, but didn't really, wasn't a friend of his, but we became friends down there simply because we were both from the same community. Yeah. So you had someone to kind of chum around with and, you know, share your misery with, if you will. Uh, but one of the, I can remember one of the real things around the fifth or sixth week, uh, if you got a certain score in your physical PT test, you got a weekend pass. So uh, I was determined to do that, <laughs> so I did. And we got a weekend pass, me and this, this buddy of mine, Dexter Cummings, both did. So we went downtown on Saturday and Sunday and, and had a good time. And then we only had another two weeks to go before we graduated. And then the seventh week of basic training, they post on the board where you're going for your next assignment and what, um, what school you're going to be going to. Okay, so. bef before we get to that, there's something I should have asked you a moment ago. When you joined the United States Armed Forces, under what conditions of time was it a four-year hitch no. or I the end of the war? I what? volunteered for the draft and I went for two years. Two years, okay. Because of that, I didn't have the option of what schooling I would receive nor what assignment I would receive. And I was pretty confident by having done that that I ended up going to Vietnam. What my job would be when I went there, I didn't know. However, I thought, I said, well, if I go in for two years and if I like it, so be it. If I don't, I'm only going to do two years and I'll be mm -hmm. home. Uh, At Fort so Gordon, were you given tests uh, to determine what you'd do for the rest of your hitch? Right. And, yes, and tell us about some of those tests. Well, so, uh, there was a, what they call a general aptitude test, which, which is uh, an aptitude for what your skills uh, would marry up with what particular um, type of job you'd have in the military. However, coupled with that is the fact that now with the buildup in the Vietnam War, what they needed most were infantry soldiers. Uh, and unless you specifically have this incredible aptitude on something, they need uh, infantry soldiers more than they need a clerk typist. So if you're only in for a couple of years and you didn't sign up for a specific job or a sp specific guarantee of a job, more than likely you're going to go in the infantry. And that's exactly what happened to me. That's where you wound up. Yep, that's where I ended up. How about this guy, uh, Dexter? Uh, did he wind up in the same place with you? Dexter went in the infantry and uh, prior to going to Vietnam, he went to Canada. So much to my chagrin. He took off and went to Canada. He did, yeah. Have you seen him since? No, I've talked to him twice on the phone, no. He came back to the United States and uh, President Carter's his amnesty program in 1976. And you went where? From Fort Gordon? Yeah. I went to Fort Jackson, South Carolina for... Uh, outside of Columbia? Right, outside of Columbia for eight weeks of uh, advanced infantry training. Tell us about that now. That's you're you're graduating into some tough stuff. Well, uh, they pretty much tell you straight out when you get there. Um, pay attention to what you're doing. Learn as much as you can, because you're all going to Vietnam. Um, I had a company of 100 and about 76 guys in my infantry training company, and that's what it was. It was eight weeks of infantry training, everything from basic rifleman skills to squad tactics to uh, maneuver tactics, um, search and destroy tactics, um, bivouac. Um, this the is use the of all of late fall or winter of 68? This is November and December of 68. Yeah. I was supposed to graduate mid-January of 69. Um, so I tried to pay as much best attention because I was pretty determined. I knew where I was going. So I, uh, I certainly paid attention. I tried to learn as many skills as I could. Did they do a good job with you? That is, uh, did you feel well prepared when you got out of there? Uh, I think they did a, a great job in physical training, um, basic skills of handling all the weaponry. We probably, uh, wonderful first aid training. 
Um, we probably could use a little bit more training in um, camouflage techniques and uh, how to avoid ambushes, things of that nature, but um, some of that stuff is just learn as you go type of uh, yeah. scenarios. You knew you were going to Vietnam. Yes, did, did the Army sit you down aside from weapons and marching around and, and that kind of stuff? Did they talk to you about Vietnam per se or the Absolutely. people there? Well, tell us about that, well, the, some, the cultural side of your trip. Some of the instructors that we had, particularly in the, in the la latter portions of the eight weeks, were recently returned veterans from Vietnam. So they told you a number of things. Um, certainly told you if you're going to be in infantry, what to ex somewhat what to expect as far as the fighting tactics of the North Vietnamese as well as the Viet Cong. Uh, they told you about the terrain, the weather, um, as well as some of the local customs of the people. Um, that portion. Enlarge on that. Uh, Tell us about what they the told you. Well. They try to instill in us that we are the, they're the host nation and we're going to assist them in their fight for freedom or their, their fight for independence, if you will. Um, Asians by nature are pretty much of a, a docile people. They're, they're very accepting of other nationalities that come into the countries. And because of that, sometimes I think those nationalities have a tendency to take advantage of, mm -hmm. of those people. Um, but they certainly passed on to us that the North Vietnamese as well as the Viet Cong were exceptionally good fighters, um, tremendous at um, camouflage techniques, uh, ambush techniques, um, booby traps, things of that nature. So um, th they passed on, I think, pretty much the knowledge of, of the countryside, as well as the um, somewhat what you're going to what to expect. Can you but, think of something that they told you that might have saved your life? Um, I think the greatest advice they may have given you is that, at least that, that I thought they gave you, is that when you get there, regardless of what your job might be, hook up with a seasoned combat soldier or NCO who can show you the ropes, show you how to survive, show you what the do's and don'ts, what not to do or what to do. And um, I think that was maybe the best advice they gave. And how long were you at Fort Jackson? Eight and a half weeks. Eight and a half weeks. So we're up to early 69 now? Yeah. Well, I'll just tell you a brief story about Fort Jackson. Just by coincidence, when I was um, uh, about five and a half, six weeks into our training there, Christmas came around. So they said to everybody, we're shutting down for eight days. You're all going home. When you get back, we've got about 10 to 12 days left of training, and you're all go to Vietnam, everybody in the company. So say your goodbyes, or tell, tell your folks and your girlfriends and your wives and your friends and so on and so on. That's where you're going. So when you get back, you have 12 days to go. When, after you graduate from AIT, you got a 30-day leave, you're going home for 30 days, then you're reporting to Oakland, California, going to Vietnam. Well, about two days prior to graduation from AIT, um, they had a company formation, and they said, this is on a Wednesday night, they said, nobody's going home, you're going to Vietnam Friday. And that's what happened. Did you say, I'd like to see the fine print of uh, that contract? Well, we had, a lot of guys were married. I wasn't, you know. Oh, uh, it, was, it was unbelievable, absolutely unbelievable. So we graduated Wednesday, and they had a 15 um, buses there on, on Friday at noon, and they put us in the bus and drove us to the airport, and off we went. Did anybody desert? I don't think so. I don't think anyone did, but we had a almost a, a mass riot, I'll tell you. So a lot of the guys that were married really had a lot of problems, <laughs> you know. I uh, bet the uh, It was unbelievable. Lines Everyone for was, the they telephones were going to the great. chaplain, they were going, yeah. calling the congressman, they were doing everything. But Do you have any idea why the Army changed its mind? I don't, and I, and I never found out. I can only assume that they must have had a 
dramatic call for a number of bodies, I guess. Uh, I don't know. Um, so you, you got on a bus and went out to some airport? Was this in Columbia or something? Yeah, yeah. Columbia, South Carolina. They, we flew from there to uh, Oakland Army Base and uh, we were there for about three or four days and they processed us in and off we went to Vietnam. Is there any specialty you developed at Fort Jackson that um, suggested what you were going to do for the rest of your time in the Army? Were well, you I, a, I knew a weapons I, man or a weapon? Well, I knew when I went to, when I, when I was going through the training at Fort Jackson, I knew I was going to go to the infantry. I mean, the, yeah, I was going to be an infantry specifically soldier. Specifically, were you a mortar man, a rifleman? Rifleman. Yeah. I was a rifleman. I, I, was, I was physically fit. I, uh, I was a very good shot. I, and um, I was ex had the highest PT score in the company, so I did well in those things. But uh, so what was your specialty? Rifleman. A rifleman. Straight infantry rifleman. A grand, with a grand at this time, or uh, M16 or An what? M16. M16. We, we had we had training in M16s rifle, which was the basic infantry rifle. Also training in M79 grenade launcher, um, M60 machine gun. Uh, we fired an M50 uh, uh, caliber machine gun, but those are pretty much most of those are mounted on armored personnel carriers. But uh, the three basic weapons that we went through were the M16 basic infantry rifle, M79 grenade launcher, and the M60 machine gun. What was the focus of the size of the group you were going to work in? Were squad, platoon, squad. battalion, squad? Well, uh, almost all infantry companies are company size. Um, unit, which depending upon the strength of the company is between 120 and 160 guys. Those companies are broken down normally into four platoons of with between 30 to 40 people per platoon and within that platoon there are four squads. Your basic maneuverability and your basic um, fighting skills are, are revolve around your squad. Then your squad is part of the platoon which is part of the company but Basically, most close in encounter fighting skills are built around the squad because your maneuverability is your squad. You know, eight to ten guys that are in your squad is uh, basically how you end up fighting. You took off from Oakland, California. Mm -hmm. um, plane, ship? Plane. And I went from Oakland, California to um, Anchorage, Alaska. From Anchorage, Alaska to Yokota, Japan, and from Yokota, Japan to Tonsonut Air Force Base in Saigon. And so it's a long flight, it's 20 hours. Yeah. Can you, sitting here in Natick tonight, mm -hmm. can you remember getting off that plane? Absolutely. I can remember, I can remember the entire flight like it was yesterday. As, you, as we were leaving Oakland, I mean, there for about three days, you went through a series of inoculations and you had to uh, get new uniforms issued and, and go over all your paperwork and set up wills and things of that nature. And then just the, the, the volume of processing people, so it took about three days you were there. But I specifically remember the flight all the way over. Um, I ended up sitting about next to this kid from Kansas um, that I didn't know other than we just ended up sitting ne next to each other. And uh, we flew, flew to, as I mentioned, Anchorage, Alaska, we just stopped over to refuel from uh, Anchorage, Alaska to Yokota, Japan. They actually stopped there for an hour. We got off, departed, and got a soda and stuff at the snack bar. Was this a military plane or a leased, no. uh, leased airline? It was a leased, it was a jet. Yeah. Um, then we went from Yokota, Japan to, uh, to Tonson. As a matter of fact, they had regular stewardesses um, serving you meals and everything. Um, Where were all your weapons? We didn't have any weapons. We just you guys. Just us guys. And you're going to pick up your weapons on the other side. Right. When you okay. To, they open the yeah. doors. Tell us about that. Opening up the doors. Uh, the, it, all I can describe to you is just this incredible blast of heat. Just incredible blast of heat. I got there in uh, January 17th of 1969, and just. Debarking the, the plane was just this, it, it just felt like almost a furnace type heat, just not, like nothing you'd ever, at least nothing I had ever felt before. 
Um, I mean, we've all experienced summers and even hot summers, but the heat there was just incredible. Um, you get off the plane and they, they loaded you onto um, military buses uh, for transferring to the in processing center at Long Bin. But uh, interesting, uh, getting on the bus, all the windows of the bus had barbed wire, or not barbed wire, um, like a mesh type wire covering the windows. So what the heck is that for? And they said, you know, so they can't throw grenades or whatever. Welcome they to Vietnam. Yeah, welcome to Vietnam. Um, but getting into, I mean, Camp Thompson Air Force Base was just monstrous. It was just, I mean, a huge, huge, huge facility, gigantic. At the time, I think it was the busiest airport in the world. Um, but we went from there to uh, the 37th replacement at Long Bend, which is about 20 miles away. And that's where they in-processed you and actually assign you to, to a unit in Vietnam. Can you distinguish between words like afraid and apprehensive, wary? How, how did I, you feel? I wasn't afraid at that time at all. I was apprehensive. I was cautious. Um, and I was concerned about, I guess, where I was going to go and what you know I was going to be assigned with and what I was going to specifically do when I got there. Were you there for a year? That is, it was, I was initially was supposed to be Was that part of the year. system then? Yeah. You served a year and a day and you went home? Right, right. I ended up serving 15 months, but I, I extended for a few months. But um, that was the initial tour, yeah, 12, 12 months. Um, my, and I never really got afraid per se. Um, when I got to Long Bend, we were there again about th two to three more days as they were assigning you to a specific unit. And I got assigned to the 11th Armored Cavalry Regiment, which I had never even heard of. I had heard of some of the units, you know, the 1st Infantry Division, the 1st Cavalry Division, the 25th Infantry Division. I had heard of those large mm, historical divisions from years past and World War II type, but I had never heard of the unit that I went to. So I had a long been when I got assigned to 11th Armored Cavalry Regiment. I said, no, I'm in cavalry, what's that? I want to be, and I was thinking to myself, I don't want to be in a tank or a, you know. So that was my first time that I started getting concerned a little bit about what I was going to do. Was anybody with you you knew? No, nobody you were, at all. You were, in that sense, alone? In that sense, I was alone. I was, yeah. So that, you know, if you have somebody with you, it, it bridges the, the fear or the apprehension. You know, you can kind of commiserate with a buddy, but uh, if you don't, you know, your concern gets a little greater, I guess. Did they toss you right into it? Or did they give you a couple of days to acclimatize? I don't know about others. I can only speak for myself. I got tossed, I mean, directly into it. Um, Tell us about that. Well, I, I, leaving Long Bend, they said you're going to the 11th Army Cavalry Regiment. And me and three other guys uh, were going there. Um, and about the fourth day, we were at the, uh, the replacement company. A helicopter came, picked us up, and flew us about 25 miles. And the farther we went from the replacement company, the more it seemed we got into the middle of the jungle. And I, we just, I, was look, I can remember looking down out of the helicopter, and all I saw was just jungle, green, green, green. I saw nothing, just jungle. So I was thinking to myself, where are we going? And finally, we got to uh, the Black Horse Base Camp, which was the Say home. Say that again. Black Horse. Black Horse. Base Camp. Yeah which is on uh, Highway 1 in Vietnam, off of, off of Highway 1, which was the, uh, the home of the 11th Island Cavalry Regiment. Were you a replacement for somebody that had been killed? Or no, I was re uh, just a replacement. Just rotation? R just normal rotation. And as we, um, as the helicopter came down to the, to the helicopter pad, there were these three old crusty, what I thought were old crusty at the time, and NCOs just standing there waiting to pick the new people coming off, off the helicopter, me being one. And um, we departed, and these four guys, these three guys are standing, those four of us. And two of the, the NCOs were from tank outfits, they were, going, they were looking for tankers. And I know I, I didn't want to go on a tank, and, and so they said, and one of the guys was from a, a long-range a long patrol unit. He says, does anyone, here, anyone want to volunteer to be in the long-range patrol? 
and everyone's just standing there looking at each other. And I knew that was walking, so I said, I'll, yeah, I'll take that. So that's how I ended up getting the job. You took that rather than riding in tanks. Yeah. That tank duty. A any, tank or any an armored personnel. Why carrier. your instinct told you to do that? I just didn't want to be stuck inside an armored personnel carrier or a tank. I just, it just seemed to me like, if something happened, you couldn't escape, or you just couldn't get out of the way. I'd rather take my chances on the ground walking. That's how I felt anyway. Let me see if I can phrase this correctly. Did you ever live to regret that decision? No, <laughs> never. It was a good one. No, I thought so. I thought so. I thought How did the guys that got in tanks make out? They had it tough, I, in, in my estimation. They used to go out for stretches of 30 to 45, 50 days in the jungle before they came back to base camp sometimes. I mean, they, they had it uh, tough, real tough, I thought. Took the unit I was in, the 11th Army Cap. They, they saw a, an extreme amount of... Uh, combat, a lot of firefights, uh, a lot of ambushes, a lot of okay. night duty. So you're part of a, a smaller group now. Much you're... smaller. A platoon, I, I was in a, just a platoon size element of 30 guys. We normally used to go out in missions of 7 to 10 guys. And you're the new man. I'm the brand new guy. How did you feel about that? Pretty lost? At that time I started getting a little worried, a little frightened. I, I was frightened at that time. Were you able to take the advice you'd been given about hooking up with somebody that right. might keep you alive. That's exactly what I did. There was, when, I, when we first got to the unit, the, the gentleman that had come to the helicopter pad initially was this guy named Sergeant Smell from S Lim... Smell? Smell, S-M-A-L, from Sm Limerick, okay. Ohio. And uh, he said, uh, I'm looking for a guy in my outfit. I, I need a, a guy to hunt my radio. I need a radio operator. Will you, you want to be a radio operator? I said, sure, Sergeant Smell, I'll do that. So that's how I ended up with him. And uh, he says, you just stay with me. I'll show you everything. I'll keep you alive. I says, that's all I want. I want that's a good offer. Yeah. yeah, and I says, no. And uh, I ended up staying in his unit with him for about six months before he rotated. He had already had six to seven months there when I got there. But by the time he rotated, I felt I was a seasoned veteran at that time. So I felt pretty confident. Tell us about going to war. Tell us about moving out with that group. Well, we used to, everything we did was by helicopters, everything. Um, and our job was to, when intelligence found a uh, suspected Vietnam bunker complex of the North Vietnamese movements of companies, they would, our job was to go out and either try to make contact with the enemy and then call in reinforcements if the the group that we met was too large for us to handle, or to gather intelligence and report back to the tanks or the armored personnel carriers, and they could go and do a search and destroy of the area that we thought was suspected movement. So uh, the advantage of our outfit was we were small in nature, we could move fast, but the disadvantage was if you ran into anything too heavy, you didn't have much firepower with you. Did so, I understand, excuse me, what you just said, that you were not yourselves to engage the enemy, but you were to gather enough information to supply to others? If we could. Okay. Right. If you could manage that. If we could manage that. Well, yeah. my very first, I was there five days with my new unit, with Sergeant Smiles. And he says, well, and I can remember this so distinctly, he says, I hate to tell you this, but your first mission is tonight. And your first mission is going to be an ambush. We're going out in an ambush tonight. So we were going out with two squads of guys, 14 guys. And um, it was my, I was, that time I really was, I was saying, oh my God, the first one I'm going out and it's night, and it's we're on a night ambush. I've never even been out in the jungle yet. Oh my God. So anyways, he says, just stick with me. Just stick with me. I'll get you. So we went out. And um, we are supposed to set up this, no, we are supposed to, we set up this ambush on, on us, alongside a trail that went by a, a dike. Uh, a rice paddy dike, and uh, we were supposed to lay out there all night, and we had received intelligence that this unit was supposed to be coming through there sometime during the evening hours or prior to dawn anyway, and at that time we were going to ambush them. Well, instead of us ambushing them, they ended up ambushing us about 3.30 that morning. And um, that was my very first, that was the very first mission I was ever on. They threw in some orders, and they one landed, and I ended up getting a piece of shrapnel in my, my 
my leg, I get eight stitches. And uh, I can remember laying there afterwards and they laughed and no one got too, we had one guy that got wounded a little bit in the shoulder, but no one got hurt too bad. And about seven o'clock that morning, the helicopters come back to pick us up. And I'm sitting, in the, I get on the helicopter, the sergeant smiles and I'm sitting there and I'm leaning up against the, the back like that. He says, oh, you did real good, you did real good. I'm thinking to myself, you've got to be kidding me, the very first night. And I got wounded, I'm never going to get out of here. Purple heart on the first night. Yeah, very, very first mission. It was, uh, it was eye-opening. Um, Let's break uh, off here for a minute for sure. a, a tangential question. Um, were you able to communicate with your parents and this large family you have back in Natick and uh, tell them what was happening to you? Or what were their strictures on you uh, by way of communications? There weren't any restrictions. Um, um, one of the things I always get teased about actually was how much mail I did receive because um, my brothers wrote to me. My mother was extremely faithful uh, about writing to me. So I got a lot of mail. Um, and for anyone that's ever been in a combat situation, or been overseas at any time, mail's a godsend, it really is. It uh, keeps your spirits up, keeps your hopes up, keeps your dreams up. Um, so I got a lot of mail. Uh, and my Good. mother was extremely faithful about writing to me. That night you were out there, did you have any idea who you were up against, who these guys were who were trying to kill you? Well, I. I knew who they were. I didn't know the strength of the, their party or how many there were. Um, but all they ever did was lob in mortars that night. Um, they, they were in a tree line and they just lobbed three or four mortars at us and then they just took off. It was almost like harassment more than they didn't try any ground action or they didn't try to attack us. So they either figured we had a larger force than they did or we had more firepower than they did because they certainly didn't try to do anything that, other than what they did. But I, uh, that was the first time I was, ever, I was very, uh, I was frightened that night. You said you were asked to be a radio man. Were you that night op, uh, right. working as a radio man? Right. I carried what was called What a, did you do with the radio? I was called, it was called a Prick 25. And I you know, hoisted it on your back. And Sergeant Smells was the uh, up, uh, squad sergeant. So my job was just to follow him everywhere we went. Um, he kept communications with the talk, the, which is the uh, Tactical Operations Center. And um, if we needed air support, uh, at, um, extraction by helicopter, uh, or any type of uh, additional um, infantry support to help us survive that night, he, that was what the radio was for, keeping communication with our, our headquarters in the event where we needed it. So I just stuck with him. He said, just follow me. He says, just follow me. Wherever I go, you stay right on my ass. I said, okay. <laughs> That's what I did. I never left him. So you got back out of that and you got medical care yes. uh, immediately as soon yeah, as you returned? as soon as you got back, yeah. Was it good care? Oh, uh, outstanding. Well, it was a medic in our company. He just had me drop my pants and put eight stitches in my leg and said, you're good to go. And that was it. So, I didn't even get any days off for that one. So, <laughs> but we didn't go out for another two days, so. What did you do in those two days off? Do you, uh, do you get time to sit around and think a lot about where you are? Yeah, and, and the time, we had a pretty, uh, pretty decent base camp. You know, unlike a lot of infantry units that went out for extremely lengthy periods of time, they may have gone out for two weeks, three weeks, a month sometime. We went out on a lot of missions of short duration. Um, the most, I think I ever stayed in the field of one stretch was five days. Very often it was just the same day. They'd drop us in the morning to uh, search a, uh, a bunker complex or to set up an ambush along a trail, and that same evening we'd get extracted by helicopters. So yeah. we'd have a lot of time back at the base camp. You did things like you played cards, you cleaned your weapons, you made sure all your, the first thing you always did was make sure all your gear was ready to, because we used to get a lot of uh, quick calls. We'd be sitting in the barracks and they'd say, suit up, and we'd, in the helicopter, we'd be already on the, hel on the pad um, getting ready to, they'd be cranked up and they'd just shoot us out to wherever, um, to, into a firefight that might be happening or into a, a place they wanted to clear. Um, 
for a convoy coming or, or something. So we, we had a lot of on-call type situations. Did you yourself ever go down in the holes? Once. Can you tell us about that? I don't know about other guys that they characterize as tunnel rats, um, but I wasn't, I'm not the biggest person in the world, so at the time I weighed probably 20 pounds less than what I weigh now. I probably weighed 150, 155 pounds at the time. And Vietnamese are rather, you know, slender people for the most part. They're probably five, 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 six for the most, five, seven. Um, they had huge, huge bunk, bunker complexes, huge. And they're set up very much what I like to say is like a, a wagon wheel. You know, they're the central hub with all tentacles off of it. And um, the tunnels, for the most part, were designed for the, the smaller frames. So in just one mission, we, we hit this bunker complex. And as we went into it, we realized that they had already evacuated. There's nobody there. We had cleared a couple of bunkers by throwing grenades in them, and we got no response from that, so we assumed that they had already taken off. They needed someone to go down into one of the bunkers, to, I mean, one of the tunnels to come over to another one just to make sure it's all clear. So he says, Sink, like, go down and check that bunker. I said, yeah, I don't think I can fit down that bunker. He says, go down the bunker and check it out. So I did, and uh, I hated it, absolutely hated it. I just, I felt claustrophobic and all closed in, and and uh, it's, it's dark, it stank, it was uh, eerie. It was, uh, really, I, I hated it, absolutely hated it. Some of the guys didn't mind it, but I, I always felt this claustrophobic, you know, what if I ever got stuck down here, what are you gonna do, type thing. So I, I, I always discouraged myself from getting involved in that, you know. Good for you. Yeah. I don't wanna miss this because, uh, but you, you may not, uh, touch on this later, but uh, did you use or require or thank God for air support at oh, any time? We had tremendous air support all the time. Can you tell us about, um, did you call them in? Yeah, uh, well, Sergeant Smells did, yeah. yeah. Um, not me personally, but he did. I, I mean, I, I could read a map pretty well. I could read grid coordinates well. Um, I mean, I could have if the job required that, but it wasn't my place to do it. It was, you know, the squad sergeants. But we had uh, Cobra gunships. Any mission we went out on, we always had Cobra gunship cover uh, within usually 10 to 15 minutes of us. Um, we had uh, Air Force jets that were probably 20 minutes away that we could call in. Um, and that happened a lot. I mean, a lot of times it, we were a pretty active um, unit. We got in a lot of uh, firefights. Um, so we had a lot of Cobra gunship coverage, a lot of uh, uh, jet coverage, uh, a lot of airstrikes, B-52s a couple of times. Really? Oh yeah, B-52 runs with 500 pound bombs, they blast a hole as big as this library, huge, just huge, it's 500 pound bombs, 1,000 pound blockbusters, gigantic, gigantic holes. So um, you better call in your coordinates very carefully. Very carefully. Oh, well, sometimes we were within five, six hundred yards of a B-52 strike, and it, if you're that close, I mean, the, the ground literally shakes. It absolutely shakes. It vibrates. It, it's so powerful. It's and just you're unbelievable. what? An 18, 19 year old kid out there. 19. And the most uh, I, I can't ask you what did you think, but how did you prepare yourself to? take this in your life as, as part, this is the way I'm living. Well, you know, I, I think, particularly in, in the military and in, in, in the infantry in, in general, one of the adages is if you're not, particularly in Vietnam anyway, if you didn't get killed or wounded seriously in the first couple of months, for the most part, I think you learn the skills necessary to survive well enough that uh, you could survive at least for the tour. The fear and being able to perform your job, uh, if you can't overcome the fear, you're probably not going to survive. So uh, you're always afraid, at least I was, you're always afraid, you always have this 
gut-wrenching feeling in your stomach just churning up um, that uh, when something's going to happen or if there's going to be a firefight. Um, but I think almost the peer pressure of trying to help your buddy as well as your buddy trying to help you just forces you to, to react. And it's, a lot of it was you don't think so much as you react. Something happens and you react. You've been trained, uh, you hear a, a weapon open up on you. You, you. If you stop and thought, you probably wouldn't even move, you know, and say. Um, so, but it's, it's more a reaction thing. Um, I think Vietnam, probably much more so than Korea or World War II, where they had established fronts, if you will. It was, Vietnam was so, um, um, once you get outside the base camps, so once you get outside the, the villages or the towns, the hamlets, Everything was was open, you know. The jungle is just there were, were no fronts, so it could be anybody. And so, if you've bumped into anyone, they're probably the enemy. But if if you got good enough at your job, you could sense. You almost developed a sixth sense of uh, there's a change in the atmosphere. There's a change in the birds chirping. There's a there's a change in the feel of the year, and you know if the enemy's around or if they've recently been there or. You can you notice the vegetation, uh, the trampling of different vegetation. So you can you get a sense of if somebody's if you're about to run into something or not, and uh, you can actually feel it. You can actually feel it almost in the back of your neck with the hair standing up. So it's an actuarial thing. The longer you live, the longer you live. Yeah, the longer you live, the longer you live, and you absolutely develop a sixth sense about danger. You really do, and you can you can pick it up. You notice. Particularly animals, you notice the, the change in, in just the sounds, and that's because somebody's around or not around. Uh, the change in the feel, the change in the, the vegetation. Um, so either you get good at that, or you know, the better you got, the the more chance you had of survival. Um, you were with a group of about thirty guys, I think 30 you guys. said. Yeah. Um, did you all make it? No, no. Um, I got shot once. Um, I'd been there about four months, and at the time I, I was no longer um, the radio opera. I was now uh, one of my friends was uh, walking point, and I was a backup to point. We used to change off, um, and we had been called to a place called the Michelin Rebel Plantation, which is near a place called Tainan City, and there was a huge. North Vietnamese bunker complex then, but we knew there was going in. And we had been in there about three or four days in a row, and every single day we went in, we ended up getting in a firefight. We either had a call, at the time we had the, the 1st Infantry Division uh, backing us up, and they had a company of infantry guys. So every day, each day that we got in a firefight, they ended up coming in to rescue us, and uh, it was pretty intense. It was right after the Tet of 1969, and um, this one day, March 21st, 1969, um, we got set down about 10 in the morning, and uh, I was with this kid from Florida, Bob Miller, and he was walking point, and I was walking back up to point, and we went up to clear this bunker, and we knew the North Vietnamese were around someplace because you could just, you could feel it, you could sense it, you just knew they were there. We got about five yards from the bunker, and we both had a grenade in our hand, we were going to throw it in, and this North Vietnamese just jumped up out of the bunker and swept with a machine gun and killed him and shot me. So that was a tough day. First day of spring. Yeah, first day of spring. The intense, intense firefight. Uh, I ended up uh, being there for about two and a half hours before they could get me. It was, it was tough. It was a tough day. You were machine gunned, lying on the ground two and a half hours. Why, why didn't you die? Um, why well, didn't you I, I, didn't, I didn't have an injury severe yeah. enough to, to kill me, first of all. I got shot in the arm. Um, but during the course of this two and a half hours, it was, um, I got shot at a whole bunch. Um, um, were you Luck able to draw. fire back, or did, oh, yeah. did you just lay there and wait for No, 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 I, I absolutely, I, I threw the grenade into the bunker, 
I absolutely fired back at him. But it was an, an intense, intense, I mean, I had my squad behind me, so when he opened up with a machine gun, they obviously fired back at him. It was a very intense, intense firefight. And uh, it, that day, about 12 guys got killed, just one in, from my unit, but about 11, 11 guys from the 1st Infantry Division got killed. And, and how did they a pull lot of, you out of there? A lot of there? enemy get, huh? How did they pull you out of there? Eventually, they, they just did fire of a movement. They kept putting down suppressing fire to, to the enemy. The enemy withdrew a little bit after a while, and they just come and drug me out, dragged me out, and, and got me back where a, a medevac helicopter would get me out of there. Um, but my friend Bob Miller didn't make it, but um, that was a tough day, real tough. What would have been your objective? The, this is a huge complex, the Michelin huge. Uh, plantation is known. Uh, huge. In all the, the sagas of the war, people talk about it. Yeah. What were you supposed to do there? I don't think there was any objective, to be honest with you. That's where they were. We're going to get them. We'd go to fight them. We'd leave. We'd come back the next day. I mean, it's just this ongoing cycle of, uh, it was close to the, um, Cambodia and close to Ho Chi Minh Trail, so they could just keep the supply route coming down, both with um, supplies as, was, as, with, as well as with people. So the more you wounded or killed them, the more they just resupply with more people. This was the time of the body count, I, yeah. I think. Uh, yeah. Were you guys expected at the end of the day to say we killed 50 today, 60 today? We were ex more than expected. We, we were required. Did you believe the numbers or the, no. were the numbers real? I, 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 I don't know about other units per se, but um, the, my unit, the 11th Army Cavalry unit, really had a, I, I think it was one of the finer combat units in Vietnam, really. And I'm not saying just because I served with it. I, I think its reputation has been that, uh, even at the time during uh, Vietnam. Um, very aggressive, aggressive uh, fighting force. As a matter of fact, my very first regimental commander was um, uh, Colonel Patton, who was General Patton of World War II. His son was my commanding officer. Really? In, yeah, in Vietnam, my first commanding officer. And he was a very, very aggressive um, commander. He, That's uh, not always good. No, but he, I mean, he was cautious but aggressive. I mean, he, uh, he believed in Let's bring it to the enemy. So that's what we, for the most part, did. We're sitting in Natick here, and it's a, a chilly November night. Most of us will never get to Vietnam, nor have we ever been there. Mm -hmm. Tell us about the smell of the place, the feel of the place. What was Vietnam for well, you during that day when you got badly well, wounded? What was it like? The, um, I love the country, uh, the country in and of itself. I think it's a beautiful country. I actually like the people. Um, but there, there are certain smells of, of uh, the country that, that are with you forever. Uh, certainly the smell of napalm. It's a, it has a distinctive smell that uh, it's a searing, smell it just burns in your nostrils, bursting, burns in your brain, that if you smell it once, you'll, you'll recognize it forever. Um, the smell of fish, the smell of uh, um, cleaning little latrines, they burned, they burned the, uh, the solid waste. So that's always a smell you had. Uh, the smell of diesel fuel, um, I, I think probably almost any veteran, it's more the smell, I think it's, it's the sounds. Uh, the sounds of helicopter blades, the sound of choppers, um, the rat-tat-tat of an AK-47, uh, you know, enemy assault rifle. It uh, has a very distinctive sound to it. Um, but the, the, and the weather, of course. Um, incredible, incredible heat, just incredible heat. And then during the wet season, just just the monsoon season was just like no rain. You'd 
if you've never been to the Orient, no rain that you could ever experience in the United States. It's just torrential, torrential rain. It's incredible rain. You were there uh, longer than a year, you told us a little right. while ago. Mm -hmm. uh, and you also told me before this interview, you had three Purple Hearts, or you were right. wounded three times. Correct. You've told us twice. Mm -hmm. Now, what's the third time? Third time I got hit by a, uh, not I personally, I mean, there was a rocket that exploded. I got a piece of uh, shrapnel in, in the leg. I ended up getting 14 stitches from that. Same leg? Same leg. Both the right leg. I got shot in the right arm. So, um, I, when I got shot, I ended up spending 42 days in the hospital. The time I got 14 stitches, I was, they gave me, I think, 10 days off. Uh, but that was in the company area. Just so the, hit, the stitches healed and then they took those out, back I went. How come you spent more than a year there? Did you volunteer? I did. I volunteered. After I got wounded the, three, the third time, at least in my unit, as well in most units in Vietnam, they, you were allowed to come out of the field. And at the time, when I got out of the field, um, they needed a, a person to, believe it or not, drive the ice truck. We used to go down each day to this ice house, pick up the ice. Come out of the field means no longer in direct no contact longer in direct. with the I enemy. stayed in the base camp the rest of the time. Okay. And I'd slept in a bed. Um, I got to take showers and have hot, hot food, hot meals all the time. And, um, and that was after about my 10th month in country. I had about 60 days to go. And at the time, uh, people that were coming back from Vietnam that only had a two-year commitment like I did, if you had five months or left less remaining on your commitment, you could um, get out of the service. So I had, I had already received my orders. I was going to go to Fort Bliss, Texas to be an instructor. And, um, and I had about eight, seven, eight months to go in the Army. I said, well, I, don't, I thought to myself, I don't want to go to Fort Bliss, Texas. This job's pretty secure. This ain't a bad job. So I extended for 62 days. So when I came home from Vietnam, it was in April, and I had less than I had like four months and 28 days to go, so they let me get out of the Army. Not knowing I was going to end up spending another number of years in the Army, but that's what I elected to do at that time. Before you uh, get out of the Army and go back in again, or uh, whatever the process was, did you feel your officers gave you good leadership and worked to keep you alive over there? You know, I, I've heard stories in the past about the lack of leadership in Vietnam and a lot of the fragging of officers and all that type of thing, but I, I can only speak for my unit. I had superb officers, excellent, excellent NCOs. Um, we had a lot of esprit de corps. Uh, it was really a pretty cohesive unit. We didn't have any problems with dope or drugs or uh, just a really a pretty solid unit. So I had, I think I had fine, fine leadership. I'm uh, not quite sure how to do this. I know you had a long career in the military. Let's talk about that before we sure. retroactively look at the whole thing as sure. a piece. How did you, you came home? I came home. You came home to Natick. Right. Uh, mom, dad, family. Everybody, yeah. What did you do? I mean, did you re-up or? No, I, well, I came home and at the time a lot of the state universities were allowing veterans um, to go to state colleges. And a friend of mine, one of the kids I mentioned earlier that I had hung around with in high school, had already gone to Vietnam and come back and he was, in, he had um, applied to Framingham State College. He says, Bob, why don't you apply to Framingham State? He says, I'm not going to call a child. He says, yeah, apply to Framingham State. So I did in uh, May of 1970. And I got accepted at Framingham State. So I started college in September of 1970. While going to college, I, um, I was going on the GI Bill. They were paying for the school and give you a stipend to go to school. I joined the reserves. Um, I maintained the, the rank that I got out of the service with. I joined the reserves, really, at the time. What was your rank then? A buck sergeant, E5 buck sergeant. 
At, and I, I joined it really for extra spending money while I was at college. So I went to France, stayed for four years, stayed in the reserves while during that time I got promoted to E6, staff sergeant. Um, I got out of uh, Fran State in 1970, um, and I was still in the reserve, stayed in the reserves, and then I went back on active duty. Um, How did that come about? Did you volunteer for that? I did volunteer, yeah. I, well, I was in the reserves, and um, um, while in the reserves, I saw something where they were looking for um, people who go out to Fort Ben Harrison in Indiana and go to guidance counselors course and uh, recruiting course. And um, my brother, Kenny, had subsequently graduated from Boston University. He had gone in the Army. He was in Germany. Um, so I said, you know, I think I'm going to do that. So I did. Um, I, I had a little trepidation just because of the anti-Vietnam and anti-military thing at the time. But I had always kept this patriotic feeling that I always had. Um, so I was, I was never disappointed or ashamed or, or anything of having served the military. I was quite proud of it. And uh, it was a tough time in the late 60s and 70s to be pro-military. It was tough. You got four years of college. Mm -hmm. um, why did the military look better to you than any career you might have gotten at that time? I wish I could give you some one word simplistic answer. I don't know. I just I had this feeling that of camaraderie, camaraderie in the service that I never felt in any other job I had had. A feeling of closeness, kinship, you know, male bonding, whatever it may, the terminology may be. It was a it was a good life. It was a good life for me. Yeah. And, and I've always felt it was a good life. Um, and uh, I tremendously enjoyed the camaraderie and the, and the, and the feeling of sharing uh, a goal. What did you sign up for in 1970 then? Uh, four years? Yeah, four years. No, and it was 1976. Excuse me, 70, uh, 75. Excuse me. 75. For, yeah, for four years. And how long did that four years last? Up until 1987. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. What did you do? I don't I, mean to encapsulate it. No, I, 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 uh, I ended up working um, about four and a half years in recruiting command. I was a guidance counselor, um, whose my job basically was um, interviewing prospective people going into the service to guide them in different career choices based on their aptitudes and things of that nature. From there, I went to um, a hospital unit uh, at Hanscom Air Force Base. I was a an advisor to the reserves. I used to set up training programs for reserve components and things of that nature. From there, I ended up going to the 187th Infantry Brigade at Fort Devens. Um, and that's where I en eventually ended up retiring from, Fort Devens, in 1987, August of 87. And what was your uh, rank at that time? Master Sergeant E8. Must have been tough for you to leave the military then. It was extremely tough. I, I, um, once you've spent that amount of time, I guess in any profession, but I think even more so in the military, it, it um, even to this day, and I've been out now 13 years, there's no job that ever um, gives you the same feeling of togetherness, I've said this word before, comradeship, comradeship, um, striving for the same goal. Um, most jobs you, you, you go to during the day and you finish up the day and, and you go home. Uh, the military isn't quite like that. I mean, you, you have a, a unit that you're you, you involved with and that specific unit has a goal within the bigger fiber uh, fabric of the military, but um, in essence, you, you, you're all in this one big green machine, the Army, I guess. Um, there's nothing that, um, there's no other occupation I've seen that, that uh, gives you that same feeling. Have you stayed in contact uh, with men that uh, you served with? I, that's what I do now. I, I have my job now is uh, I'm a national service officer for disabled veterans. And I represent veterans that are filing claims that 
before the Department of Veterans Affairs that have been hurt or injured or wounded in service. So I, I pretty much still have my, my hand in the whole military um, organization, mm -hmm. I guess. Who, who do you work for? Disabled American Veterans. No, is that, is that a, that's a... That's a non-profit organization. A non-profit. It's, it's a military organization. That's the DAV? DAV. Okay. Like, just like the American Legion, yeah. uh, VFW. It's a DAV, Disabled Veterans. Do you think you have that job because you extended your Army career in a nice, um, helpful way? Well, I think I have the job for a couple of reasons, that being one. The other also that I was also wounded in service, which is a prerequisite for being belonging to the DAV. Um, so both of those um, items probably play a part in my, my having got the job, but I enjoy it very much. I, uh, I enjoy representing veterans and helping veterans. Good for you. I'm still involved a lot in different types of veterans things. I give speeches at Memorial Day and things of that nature. Particularly uh, men with whom you served in Vietnam. Right. Do you have reunions? Yep. Uh, um, this year, um, they have one every year in different parts of the country. Based, of course, upon the location. Some you can make, some you can't. Um, this year was in Las Vegas, Nevada, which was a little, little far to go. But I also, each year, belonging to the DAV, we have a national convention every year of disabled veterans, and um, I go to that every year also. Um, this year we had it at Reno, Nevada in August. We usually have about 4,500, 5,000 guys that are there. Well, guys and women. Uh, so I go every single year to the Disabled Veterans National Convention. Uh, Belong to the American Legion. Okay, I, would, um, I was going to ask you if you belong to any veterans yeah. groups other than that. Yeah, when the mil you, military order the Purple Hat. Um, when you go to the ones with the men you served with in Vietnam, what do you talk about? Surprisingly enough, we, we talk. I think I, I think it's like kinship. Um, I don't. I serve, actually I, I meet a lot with guys that I served in unit, the 11th Armored Cab, but not necessarily specifically with me. I, I still deal with quite a few of those um, just in the greater Boston area. Um, and I even do claims work for them with the Department of Veterans Affairs. So I see a lot of those guys often. Um, and I, hope, of, sure. I hope when you talk to these men, you tell them what you've done here tonight. Oh, absolutely. And that they would be welcome here. Okay. I certainly will pass that on. That's fine. We, we would like to have them here. Okay. I didn't ask you before, when you were on the line, did you ever get sent back to where uh, you got R&R, &R, um, right. yeah. where something I knew in another war as USO shows? Did you right. get recreational shows come and see you, something like that? Both. I had an R&R &R at uh, Taipei, Taipei, Taiwan. Um, I was, had been in Vietnam for about nine months, and I got a five-day R&R in Taipei, uh, which was outstanding. Just had a terrific time. Also, while I was there, I saw a Bob Hope uh, show at Christmas time uh, in 1969. Uh, yeah, 69, Christmas 69. Um, and he had his, you know, his whole traveling uh, show, which was tremendous, you know. Um, and we got one in-country R&R uh, &R at a place called Vung Tao. We had a three-day R&R. &R. Um, so, yeah, we had a couple of breaks there. That's good. Yeah. Before you went over to Vietnam, how much did you know about the, uh, the Viet Cong? And, and their capabilities. Uh, well, prior to go in the service, I, I knew very little of it. Um, what I learned about the Viet Cong, what I may have learned At about Fort Jackson, you picked right, up a yeah, lot, yeah. a lot there. But even that did not um, do justice to them. Um, I'm not one of the. I don't know. Maybe some veterans have f strong feelings against the Viet Cong, but I. I thought they were just marvelous, marvelous warriors. They're a, they're a formidable enemy. Um, 
And I've never had any animosity of them. They were, they were nothing more than, a, they could have been Americans that just happened to be born in Vietnam or North Vietnam, and uh, they were doing what their country called of them, and we were trying to do what our country called of us, so. Um, but they were marvelous, So your opinion warriors. didn't change after you were there, in fact. No, it, as a matter of fact, reinforced. It, it reinforced even, I, I thought they were better than I ever envisioned them to be. They were tremendous, tremendous uh, capabilities of taking little and making a whole bunch out of it, you know. What about your weapons vis-a-vis uh, -vis what they had? You mentioned their AK-47. Do you feel their equipment was good or uh, as bad or well, worse than yours? Uh, Americans certainly had a heck of a lot more firepower than they did. You know, we had the use of jets, artillery, um, mortars. Um, they had their basic infantry rifle was the AK-47, which was, a, I think, a, a Soviet assault-made rifle, and it was a superb, absolute superb weapon. As a matter of fact, it probably could take more abuse um, than the M16, which was the American infantry rifle. Uh, certainly, it could get wetter, um, dirtier, and keep functioning uh, more so than ours could, but I think ours may have had a, a, f a higher rate of firepower and, and larger magazine clips and things of that nature, but um, it was a good weapon. The AK-47 was an excellent weapon, absolute excellent weapon as is the M16, but the M16 you had to keep clean. You had to pay attention to it, because if it got wet, it got dirty at all, it would jam. And uh, you don't want your weapon jamming when you need it, that's for sure. So you really had to pay attention to it. Well, sir, you had a long career uh, in the United States Army. Mm. Is there a most memorable experience that you come back to more often than anything else? No, my most memorable experience of my, my military career, without question, is Vietnam. It was a crystallizing event of my life. Um, both good as well as bad, you know. I, uh, um, y you form bonding friendships probably that you'll never have any other time in your life. And yet, uh, war is certainly an ugly, ugly uh, thing to have to experience. But um, I used to have this expression, you know, um, you haven't lived till you almost died. Life has a special flavor the protected will never know. And uh, there's a lot of truism in that. Um, you haven't lived till you almost died sometimes. And, and there's, a, there's a certain height, there's a certain exhilarance, exhilarance about uh, being in combat, it, it's, uh, you're never more alive and never more, you never cherish life as much as you do with those, those moments, and yet it can all be gone in a, in a flash, so. Um, it was probably the, the most memorable experience of my military career, no question. Though I had, had some wonderful times afterwards also. That's, I, I, that's very well said. Is there a, a memorable character that sticks up in your mind? Yeah, we used to, we had this one, one kid from the, in, I had two characters really, two real characters in, in my military career. One, one was this kid that uh, we affectionately called Fruitcake in, in Vietnam, he's from Nebraska. And they call him that specifically because that's how he, how he, uh, how he acted. Uh, he loved, he just loved being there. He thought it was just an extension of going out in the fields and running around and hey, this is a great old time. And, he, um, he never focused on the, on the bad parts of it, he only focused on the good parts of it. And that's, you're with your bunch of buddies and you're having a good time and, and you're all, at night if, you, if times are quiet, you're playing cards and you're drinking beer and you're having some laughs and boys and this great. And so he thought it was a great time. People used to say, well, you know, you're a fruitcake. And that's how he ended up getting his nickname. Did fruitcake make it through all right? Fruitcake made it through. As a matter of fact, I uh, occasionally hear from him. Yeah, he ended up being a, ended up becoming a policeman, as a matter of fact, in Nebraska, tiny tiny town in Nebraska, and another uh, a guy a guy named Dan Schreider that I met later on in my military career from Wisconsin was a, a great guy, great guy that uh, a real odd personality also. Um, always used to do crazy things, have 
clown uniforms on at Halloween and, you know, just a real character. So, uh, but you meet a lot of different personalities in the service, particularly the longer you're in. You know, you meet people from the South that may have one type of way they live and people from the West and the Midwest. And, and so it's a blending of a lot of great personalities. I hope some of there, the, the, there's a book in you that uh, you put down on paper. You've got some good stories. Mm -hmm. When you got out at Fort Devens, mm -hmm. uh, you were a master sergeant. Right. And w w with what decorations? You showed me a board that mm -hmm. uh, you've displayed some of them earlier. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us some of the decorations you received? I received, uh, well, as I mentioned, a uh, couple of purple hats. Um, Bronze Star, uh, Meritorious Service Medal, Army Commendation Medal, uh, NCO Professional Development uh, Medals, Vietnam Campaign Medals, Vietnam Service Medal, uh, Army Service Ribbon, uh, a Combat Infantry Badge, uh, Presidential Unit Citation. Um, I'd, I'd, I'd would venture to say probably my proudest decoration is the Combat Infantry Badge, but it's because I, I feel it's a select group of uh, soldiers that have had a, that have been uh, that have paid the price to earn it. Um, you have to have been in direct combat uh, to get a combat infantry badge, and uh, it's a select group of warriors that have had a been in tough situations and survived. I have a feeling that I haven't asked you the right question here as we went along, or you're being very modest now. With that group of decorations, what did you do to get some of those? Well, purple you hats are, are pretty self-explanatory. No, uh, uh, the, the purple hats are pretty self-explanatory. Uh, I got wounded, as I mentioned, uh, few times. Uh, the Bronze Star is... Um, let's, let's go with that one. Okay. How did you win that? Um, it was during the operation when, um, when I got shot and uh, Bob Miller uh, died. And during that, um, I had been pinned down for about two and a half hours and I Ended up getting Bob Miller. Uh, I, I dragged him out so they could evacuate the body, and and um, I was put in for that award. For that, I'm not going to come all the way forward to uh, Fort Devens. That was long after you'd been in, over in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. What were your feelings about coming home from Vietnam to America at that particular time? Um, I had uh, different sets of emotions, actually. I was um, extremely thrilled to be coming home, and particularly coming home alive in one piece, and a lot of guys paid a heck of a lot greater price than I did. Um, I couldn't wait to get home to Natick and get home to my family and, and mm -hmm. the parents that I adored and the brothers and sisters that I missed, so I, I really eagerly anticipated that. Mixed in with that feeling, there was this, this sense of abandonment of the people and the, the fellow soldiers I was leaving behind. A real awful sense of, of uh, abandonment. And I can remember I had been home about two to three days, and my dad at the time was the commander of the American Legion in Natick. And as a matter of fact, one of the, I think the, the, the proud moments of his life, I think he was the first Legion commander, at least a Natick, that swore in his Vietnam son into the American Legion. So he was really thrilled about having the opportunity to do that for me. But I can remember I was home about two or three days, and I was sitting at the kitchen table. And uh, my father hadn't left for work yet, and I had gotten up early, and I was having a coffee. And he said, how you doing? I said, eh, all right. And he, and he said, what's the matter? I said, I just, I feel like I'm not supposed to be here. I'm still supposed to be in Vietnam with the guy, everyone I left behind, I felt this weird sense of abandonment. He says, well, you know, you, you've, you've done the part you were supposed to do, and, and um, now it's somebody else's job to do it, so you can't feel like that. 
And I said, well, that's pretty good advice, I guess, Dad, but, you know, that, that's how I feel. So the emotions were uh, strange uh, for first coming home. I had, as I mentioned to you, uh, pretty much my whole life I had a pretty strong patriotic feeling. And I, I honestly felt that going to Vietnam was the right thing to do. Um, history has shown that some of the decisions may have been poor political decisions ever having get involved there, but I never felt that I made a mistake, nor have I ever regretted going there. But when I came home, and particularly when I started Frame State, it was the height, I mean the height of the anti-Vietnam uh, war movement, and I had a, a lot of difficulties with my peers, I really did. Um, uh, to the point where I, I got in some physical altercations with people that mm, did things to American flags or things of that nature, you know. So I had a lot of turmoil about it as far as I was concerned. And I really had, it took me a while to, to come to grips with, you know, hey, people think what they think and, and, you know, they're entitled to their opinion as well as I'm entitled to mine and you just got to move on in life, you know. But uh, I've never regretted going. And even though I don't think it was politically the right thing for the United States to participate in the war the way they did. Either if you're going to fight the war, fight the war. If you're not, try to get a political resolution to it. Well, you've just answered, I think, uh, what I was going to ask you next. Um, let's get back to your talking to your dad for just a minute. Sure. Um, did you and he talk often about uh, where you had been and what you'd done? Yeah. Um, my father was, uh, not surprisingly enough, a very patriotic guy himself, you know. And um, he had always been involved uh, in the American Legion here in Natick. Uh, he was chaplain a number of times, and um, as I mentioned earlier, he was involved in the Cub Scouts and Babe Ruth baseball and um, um, Pee Wee hockey and all those types of things. So, um, and I, he was very proud that I, that I, um, that I served in Vietnam. I think he was equally proud that I, um, I did what he felt was the right thing to do, you know. And he used to tell me in so many words he was um, that um, he was proud of what I did proud of the service that I did, um, proud that it, uh, I served in a tough situation, did the job honorably, um, and, you know, he was proud that I um, won the awards and proud that I was wounded, actually, because um, he thought that's what, you know, infantry people do. And uh, so he, he was, used to like to, to go down the Legion, we'd go down the Legion, we'd have a beer together, and, you know, mm -hmm. the guy, you know, he was happy and proud about those moments with his fellow Legionnaires, and, and I was proud of him. I mean, I, I, I thought the world of my father. Uh, he, was, uh, he was always one of my heroes, he really was. He was a great guy, just a great guy. He set a great example for everyone. We're almost uh, to the end of what uh, I think has been a, a, a very good conversation with you tonight, is there one overarching thought, incident, memory that uh, you'd like to tell us about that you haven't mentioned up to now? Well, I think probably the proudest moment, uh, proudest moment of my military career was, um, as I mentioned earlier, um, Colonel Patton, who was the son of the famous General Patton of World War II, was my commanding officer. And um, the day I got shot, they had medevaced me to the 73rd Replacement Hospital in, in Long Bend. And he was the type of commander that always made a, uh, a particular effort to visit any of his soldiers that got wounded in the field. He'd go the next day or the or day after to stop by the, the hospital bunk and say a couple of words of encouragement, uh, thank them for uh, performing the service that they did. So while in the hospital, I, by coincidence, I, I, the bed next to me was also 
uh, 11th Armored Cav uh, soldier that um, got wounded. And um, Colonel Patton and the, and the uh, regimental sergeant major came in and pinned the, the Purple Hearts on both myself as well as the other guy and told us what a credit we were to the, to the fighting spirit of the 11th Cav and, and what a credit we were to our specific units and we've done a great job and you know keep charging forward and I, I burst with pride so much I, I was ready to jump. I mean it was just, I mean as odd as it, as it is there you are laying in the bed trying to recover but I, I just, I, I burst with pride. I felt so, uh, uh, so much pride at what he had said. Um, so th that moment has always kind of stuck with me. And then after I retired from the military, he is a retired three-star general who now lives up in uh, Hamilton, Massachusetts. So I wrote him a letter in 1988 and uh, just telling him how proud I was to serve, have served under him and mentioning again the story that I just relayed to you about how he pinned the Purple Hat. And he answered me back saying that he remembered that. I'm, I'm guessing that he did. And uh, it's, he always loves getting so, uh, letters from uh, fellows that served under him and he was proud to have been the commander he'd love at that McCallie. So it was really nice. So that has always kind of stuck with me. He was a great, uh, a wonderful commander, really was. And you evidently were a good soldier. Don, I think I did a fun, fun Thank job. you for coming in tonight. It's my pleasure. We really much appreciate it. Thank you very much. I appreciate it.